a rerun of the 20th century. But this time, there is a big difference. This time, there is a third player. And this third player has no stakes in Europe, no military presence, no strategic influence, not yet. But it's watching the standoff closely. I'm talking about China. What would China do if war breaks out? The past offers some clues. In 2014, when Putin annexed Crimea, China was on the fence. They did not recognize Russia's occupation. At the same time, they blamed the West for creating this crisis. And 2022, this year, could be a repeat of that. China cannot publicly endorse an invasion. They cannot support a war. What they can do is this. A. Blame the West for instigating the crisis and B, help Putin navigate Western sanctions. They've done it before, in 2014. And they will do it again if war breaks out. In fact, Chinese state media is already doing the groundwork for this. Let me show you some headlines. Here's what one of them says. US needs Ukraine crisis to legitimize its military presence in Europe. Here's another one. Instigating Ukraine crisis serves US interests. You see the pattern. And this will be China's first step. Blame the West. Step number two will be undermining Western sanctions. It's something of a Chinese speciality. America's rivals are China's business partners, whether it's Iran, Venezuela, or North Korea. We saw an indication of this at the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics. Vladimir Putin was also in attendance. He signed an important energy deal with Xi Jinping. China will buy oil and gas worth $117 billion from Russia. $117 billion. It's simple logic. If Europe shuts the tap, all of that Russian gas will have to go somewhere, and that somewhere could well be China. And the numbers support this plan. In 2021, China-Russia trade reached $146 billion. That was up almost 36% from 2020. So Xi and Putin are sinking their economy. Even Washington is aware of this plan. If we see foreign companies, including those in China, uh, doing their best to backfill U.S. export control actions, uh, to evade them, uh, to um, uh, get around them. Uh, I wouldn't want to speculate on uh, what those tools are, but we do have tools uh, that can address that, and that would seek to account for that. That's a warning for Chinese companies. If you help Russia, we will target you. The problem is such threats may have worked in 2014. Back then, Chinese companies needed the Western market. Today, the equation has changed. China won't think twice before violating Western sanctions. But what's in it for them? Vladimir Putin is getting a market for his oil. He's getting relief from sanctions. What is Xi Jinping getting? Well, he's getting two things. Number one, a template for invading Taiwan. China is looking for America's weaknesses. How eagerly are they supporting Ukraine? What kind of weapons are they sending? Will U.S. soldiers get involved? These answers will determine China's own plans for Taiwan. If America's response is weak, it will embolden China. Plus, it's a valuable distraction for them. In 2021, all the focus was on Beijing, on their genocide in Xinjiang, on their piracy in the South China Sea, and their attempts to cover up the Wuhan virus origins. But this crisis in Ukraine is a breather for China, a chance to plan a sneak attack. And once again, history offers clues. Let me take you back to 1962. The whole world was focused on the Caribbean. The Soviet Union was deploying ballistic missiles in Cuba. It was an existential threat for America. From Cuba, the Soviet Union could hit almost all of eastern U.S. Simply put, it was the closest the West came, or the world came, to nuclear Armageddon. Guess what was China doing in 1962? China was attacking India. Chinese troops advanced along the border. In the western sector, they attacked Ladakh, and in the east, they attacked the NEFA, the Northeast Frontier Agency. It was a surprise attack. We cannot rule out something similar this time. Maybe a move on Taiwan or something along the line of actual control. Who knows? That's benefit number one for China. Benefit number two, China is getting a much-needed Pacific partner. And this will entice Xi Jinping. He has more rivals than friends in the Indo-Pacific. The Quad, the AUKUS, the ASEAN, all of them are working against China. So Xi Jinping needs a Pacific ally. And who better than Vladimir Putin? Russia's Pacific coastline is 4,500 kilometers long. More importantly, it's a veteran naval power. 
Russia's Pacific fleet was established in 1731 and Putin is not shy to deploy them. Last year, Russian and Chinese warships encircled Japan. Beijing called it business as usual, but Tokyo was spooked. They expressed concerns over this rare team up. Chances are we'll see more such drills. It was evident after the meeting between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. Here's what their joint statement said, and I'll read out a part of it for you. Russia and China have made consistent efforts to build an equitable, open, and inclusive security system in the Asia-Pacific region. They don't call it in the Pacific. Do you notice the difference in terminology? The Quad calls for an open, free, and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Russia and China are calling for an open and inclusive security system. Their focus is not on trade or shipping. Their focus is on influence and power. So if Russia goes to war, China's policy is clear. Strike a balance in public and behind the scenes, keep the Russian economy afloat. It's a role reversal of sorts. In the late 1940s and early 50s, two giants ruled Russia and China, Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong. Back then, the equation was different. Stalin used to advise Mao. He used to pull the strings. He even kept Mao waiting in Moscow for weeks, humiliated him, treated him like the leader of a vassal state. This time, the rules have reversed. If Russia is to survive this game, Putin needs Xi Jinping. And that's, that puts him in a vulnerable position. Vion is now available in...